Hi, I'm Paul Jay. Welcome to the analysis.news. Please don't forget the donate button, the subscribe button, the share button, all the buttons. And we'll be back pretty soon with Eve's Angler and Larry Wilkerson to talk about the upcoming NATO conference, NATO summit. The NATO summit is a meeting June 14th in Brussels, where leaders from all the member countries are expected to attend, including President Biden, who will try to, quote, assert America's leadership at the head of the table, as he has described it. Biden said on June 7th at a meeting with the NATO Secretary General in Washington that he considers Article 5 of the NATO treaty to be, quote, a sacred commitment. Article 5 commits each member state to consider an armed attack against one member state in Europe or North America to be an armed attack against them all. The NATO Secretary, General Jen Stolenberg, said that, quote, we face a wide range of different security challenges and no ally can face them alone, including Russia, China and terrorism. NATO has 30 members. In 1949, there were 12 founding members of the alliance, Belgium, Canada, Denmark, France, Iceland, Italy, Luxembourg, the Netherlands, Norway, Portugal, and the United Kingdom and the United States. The other member countries are Greece and Turkey that joined in 1952, Germany in 55, Spain in 82, Czech Republic, Hungary, and Poland in 1999, Bulgaria, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Romania, Slovakia, and Slovenia, in 2004, Albania and Croatia, 2009, Montenegro, 2017, and North Macedonia in 2020. NATO is primarily a military alliance. It was founded in 49 to support, supposedly counter a threat from the Soviet Union. Well, there's little to no evidence that there ever really was a threat of Soviet troops marching west. And there's a great deal of evidence that the Soviets were mostly in a defensive posture, it's all moot now anyway, as there's no longer a Soviet Union. Is there a credible threat of Russia marching west or even into some of its neighboring countries? Even Henry Kissinger said the Crimea annexation does not point to a larger strategy of using military means to grab territory. Well, if so, then what's the point of NATO at all? Now joining me to discuss the bigger question of why a NATO and some of the specific issues facing this summit in, in Belgium is Colonel Lawrence Wilkerson. He's the former chief of staff to Colin Powell at the Joint Chiefs and the State Department. And he's Angler. He's a Montreal-based author and activist. He's published 11 books, including his latest House of Mirrors, Justin Trudeau's foreign policy. Uh, thank you both for joining me. And Larry, let's, let's start with the bigger question, and then we'll get into some of the more specific issues. But uh, is, is there a point to NATO? What, why does it, what's its rationale for existence now? Let me correct one thing you said, because it violates all the policy I learned for 40 some odd years. It's not just a military alliance, it's a political alliance too. I think that's one reason why it has endured so, so long. Yeah, that's why I use the word primarily a military alliance. But, okay, I, I left myself some wiggle room there, but go on. Yeah, I would probably say now it's primarily a political alliance. But I think um, my original thoughts about it when Powell and I were discussing this, when he was chairman of the Joint Chiefs, and then later when he was Secretary of State, and the situation had been exacerbated majorly in regards to what I'm going to say, that the expansion we have achieved has made it a non-viable alliance. And by that, I simply mean, I think there are very few Americans who are going to say when someone says honor Article 5 for many of these new entry entrants, what and where? You mean I'm going to risk nuclear war over what? Where did you say again? Show me on a map. Um, and so once you've done that, once you've pushed it to and beyond the limits of its viability, I think it's very questionable whether it's a, a valid military alliance, certainly, and even a political alliance. And when I say that about the political alliance, I remember vividly the arguments we had, the debates we had, and the pressures on us, for example, during what was then called the bombing in Kosovo or the bombing in Serbia um, when we were trying to keep that element of 
the former Yugoslavia in some kind of Western camp. And we couldn't get anyone in NATO politically, and that was important, or ultimately militarily to support what we wanted to do. Um, they didn't want to take on Milosevic. They didn't want anything to do with that mess. That had been pretty much the way they dealt with the whole Balkans imbroglio for some time. But we had to go into Blair and we had to go to Clinton and Wes Clark, then the Supreme Allied Commander in Europe and the NATO guy, uh, in addition to being the commander of the U.S. European Command, of course, um, had to bifurcate, if you will, his interests between Blair on the one hand, Clinton on the other hand. It wound up costing Wes Clark his job because he talked Blair into getting Clinton to back ground troops were they necessary, long story. Um, it was an untenable situation, really, and it only worked out to the extent that, uh, you know, the Russians didn't land major forces there as they threatened to do and so forth. Um, but it, it's gotten past that now. I don't know how you would ever get agreement unless it was a, a, you know, a Russian invasion, ground invasion into the midst of Norway or Poland even or wherever. And I don't think Putin's stupid enough to do that, nor do I think any future Russian leader would be stupid enough to do that. They can win so many other ways as Putin is proving every day now. So I, I'm wondering where it's going. That's my big question now. What, what is the purpose of NATO now? other than a talking shop and a place where we can talk about selling our arms. I saw today in the New York Times, I think, that we have the top five arms merchants in the world, and we dominate the top 12 or something like that. I don't doubt that for a minute. The same question. Uh, what, what, what's, what, I guess there's two ways to frame this question to you. Why does the Canadian government seem to continue to be so committed to NATO? And then what do you think they should be doing? Well, I think the Canadian government's committed to NATO because it's been a tool to bring uh, the European colonial power under a U.S.-led geopolitical umbrella. That's the beginning of NATO in the late 40s and 50s of bringing the decolonizing world, um, uh, bringing sort of the... the uh, the U.S. as the main player in the decolonizing world. And right at the time, Canada, Canadian officials, American officials, you know, justified sending troops to Korea uh, in the Korean War on the grounds of NATO, which is, of course, Korea is about as far from the North Atlantic region as anywhere in the world. Um, so it was never a defensive uh, uh, alliance. It was, uh, you know, propped up European colonialism in Africa and Asia, uh, Canada delivered huge amounts of weapons to the European powers as they were suppressing independence in Algeria and elsewhere. And Canada was right at the, you know, it was the, the U.S., Canada, Britain that that began the alliance. And, and that's basically continued on to, until today. We have, you know, the war in Afghanistan. There was 40,000 Canadian troops in Afghanistan as part of NATO mission, the bombing of Libya in 2011, Canadian uh, military training in Iraq, uh, mission in Latvia. Um, this and now increasingly NATO is focused on China as this whole shift towards pivot towards China ramps up. Uh, NATO's uh, starting to talk about how they're going to focus more and more on China. And and so from from the Canadian government's perspective, they they see themselves as you know close to the heart of the U.S. led empire. Uh, from the standpoint of uh, Canadian military, NATO is a justification for spending more on the military. Same thing for the arms companies. Um, and so there, there's that this is, you know, the, why not, right? Like, let's, this is a tool to put pressure on Canada, increase military spending, which the military likes, which arms companies like. Um, it's it's a tool of, of domination. Uh, it may play some role in checking China's uh, rise. Uh, and the Canadian government's been you know, committed to US-led empire for uh, at least since the end of World War II. And NATO has been the sort of central tool uh, or a central tool in, uh, in, that, uh, in that process. Clearly the, the main focus of NATO's uh, rhetoric is against Russia. And, and then they talk about the rise of China. Um, 
although I was kind of uh, a little surprised in some ways. I went back and I read a couple of speeches by this uh, current uh, Secretary General of NATO, Stolenberg, and he actually, in, in one of his major speeches, only mentioned the issue of Taiwan once and, and not in the kind of framing that you're hearing from the, whether it was Trump or the Biden administration. Uh, and then also a very specific, made a big point of saying China's going to be the largest economy in the world soon. We have to trade with it. And China is not an adversary, were his words. Um, whereas Russia is, is considered an adversary, and, and that seems to be the focus. Larry, wh where do you take, is there, is there, first of all, somewhat of a difference on, on the NATO position on China than the American? Does that reflect some differences between Europe and the United States? And, and, and where is this Russian aggression they're so concerned about? I mean, other than they point to Crimea and eastern Ukraine, but you know, based on any real threat level, that's not enough to justify uh, the, uh, a, a significant movement of troops uh, towards uh, closer to Ukraine, NATO troops. Let me say first that uh, I, I want to go back to one thing that Eve said. I want to reinforce what he said. The Korean War, if you go back and look at it really closely, was Dean Acheson's instrument for sending money to NATO, to Europe. We, we starved the Korean theater of operations because most of the money went to NATO. It was the threat of the Soviet Union on the Korean Peninsula that Dean Acheson very cleverly used to get the Congress convinced that the money ought to go to Europe that he'd wanted all along. With regard to the situation right now in Russia and China and in Stoltenberg, he's a very interesting individual to look at. He's a product of our carefully crafting the future Secretary General of NATO. If you look at how he rose to that position, every point along the way of significance, we helped him get and we pushed him into. That's the way we do things in the empire. Uh, we don't always win with the head of the IAEA or the head of the OPCW or the head of whatever international organization, but that's the way we do things and NATO very principally that way. I think what you're seeing though, and I've talked with, as I said, Norwegians, Finns, Swedes, Poles, and others in the last year is a genuine fear on their part, particularly the Scandinavian countries of the Russians. They watched what happened in the Eastern part of Ukraine, what happened in Crimea, and there they are, their people are concerned. In fact, conscription has been reintroduced and it's interesting how they did it. If you're a conscript, you only have to defend Norway. If you're a volunteer, you have to go fight in these other wars. <laughs> so it's very clever the way they differentiated, even within their own domestic environment, what they really are worried about. And it, what they're worried about is Russia. And I have to give the Finns and others like that some credit for worry, Poles. Uh, Russia has a history of doing things that uh, aren't necessarily favorable to their statehood. I think there is a different approach to the two different uh, near peer powers, as my Pentagon pals call them. Um, and I don't think China is even a near peer power anymore. I think China is uh, every bit the power in East Asia it's replaced the United States in that regard. We can contest it all day long, but they are the power there now. It has to be reckoned with. And they're increasingly the power in a global sense, particularly economically. And they know that, and they're very Sun Tzuian about this. They, they're not gonna, they don't want war. They just wanna keep rolling with their base road initiative, both the maritime and now the Silk Road, the Silk Polar Road, or the Polar Base, uh, base Road. Um, they have a road for everywhere, in other words, and it's all economic. Um, the Europeans appreciate that, I think. And your last point, you're right, too, about Russia. Russia's not going to roll into any place. Now, Russia put 80,000 troops on the Ukraine border. And as Mike Sweeney pointed out in his very fine article, had we challenged Russia on that border, they'd have beat the crap out of us. And then the question would have been, because they're operating on interior lines, so significantly so we couldn't even begin to beat them tactically in a situation like that. The question becomes then, what would we do? 
will we back up and say, we're the, we're the greater power. We've got time. We, we'll bury them eventually. Let's keep going and let's do what we have to do. No, we'll probably go nuclear. And, and so Mike, Mike's point is that we're going to lose that first battle badly. There are going to be 10,000 casualties, probably most of them KIA, in the first 24 hours. Same thing with Taiwan. So these are two scenarios that are you know, militarily right now are being considered uh, r rather dire scenarios. And okay. frankly, the all-volunteer force doesn't know what to do with it. It's 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 so dangerous because the the, the NATO uh, troops, uh, quoting the Secretary General, uh, they've they've moved four combat battle groups what, to what he calls the eastern borders of NATO. He doesn't say specifically where they are, um, and now you've got Heritage Foundation, which is uh, you know this neoconservative group that's had it's been very influential in U.S. foreign policy. And they're calling for, at these NATO meetings, they want to see a, a Black Sea strategy. And when you look at the Black Sea, it, it's a tinderbox if, if they have, if they want to start some kind of confrontation with Russia in the Black Sea. What, what, are the, what, are, what are they talking about when they talk about a Black Sea strategy? Well, they want the war. <laughs> I'm, I'm convinced that some of these people, heritage included, want the war. Um, and, and they're convinced, as, as Mike points out in his article, at least indirectly, that, that we're going to win it. And it's just, abs as you're saying, it's absolute nonsense. The Black Sea, in many ways, is a even worse operating on interior lines versus us on exterior lines than is the, uh, the, the Donbass in the Ukraine region. Uh, this is crazy. Uh, yeah, would we win ultimately? I don't know. Is having a nuclear exchange, strategically speaking, uh, a win? I don't think so. But that's the kind of nonsense that's going on. And it's what, I, I, as I said, I think there's some people in the Pentagon who have some brains who are really worried about this. They know we have not the force to deal with this on a sustained basis. And yet we're threatening to deal with it on a sustained basis. Indeed, at one point we were saying, when Bill Burns weighed in, Bill Burns weighed in with that famous cable back from Moscow when he was our ambassador there. And God bless him for bringing adult leadership to the Biden administration right now. He said, in, I think the, the subject line said, Nyet still means Nyet in Russian. <laughs> because Putin had said, you do that and I'll bloody your nose badly. And he could do the same thing in the Black Sea. Would we win ultimately, even if it stayed conventional? Yes, probably. And he knows that, but he would take advantage of that bloody nose. And he is a chess master at taking advantage of U.S. mistakes. I don't know if American nuclear war strategy has changed, but Daniel Ellsberg says that at least it used to be if an American battalion and a Soviet battalion ever fought with each other it would automatically trigger an American first stri nuclear strike to take out essentially all the major cities of Russia. And they would do it knowing that the counterattack would take out at the very least in those days, all the major cities of Europe. I mean, the insanity of all this. And, and Eve's Canada, the Canadian government, they, they don't even, they don't talk about any of this. They just go along with this uh, as if it all makes some kind of sense. Well, I mean, Canada's got uh, 500 plus troops leading a thousand troops in Latvia, and they're they're a, they're a tripwire, right? They're there for if uh, there's enough of them there that if the Russians came in, uh, that would they would obviously get defeated by the Russians, but that would lead to a full scale. The NATO would be forced to go to full scale war with Russia, um, which uh, which is an insane strategy. Uh, it goes completely, you know, the, the agreement of NATO not going one inch uh, east uh, as part of the uh, the removal of uh, Russian troops from Eastern Europe. It goes completely against that. Yeah, talk a bit about that. That's a critical piece of the history. A lot of people don't know. Well, it, it was agreement between uh, Gorbachev and uh, I guess Reagan around, uh, you know, ending ending uh, Soviets. Uh, Russia's troops in in uh, in Germany and throughout Eastern Europe as part of the end of the the Cold War, uh, and that was I guess it was never done written written down in in a, in a formalized agreement, but it was communicated clearly between the U.S. and uh, Russian leaders, and and uh, 
NATO has just completely ignored that to the point where there are now NATO members on the border of Russia. There are now North American troops on the border of Russia, uh, just setting up a situation that's uh, ripe for, uh, you know, as you mentioned, you know, nuclear war or or some you know terrible conflict. And and Canadian officials don't care. I mean, one of the things that's being discussed in recent days is bringing the Ukraine into NATO, right? And and uh, Prime Minister Trudeau. Uh, had a had a, a call with Zelensky, the Ukrainian uh, leader, uh, yesterday or the day before, um, basically getting Canadian commitment for the uh, agreement to bring uh, Ukraine into NATO. Um, and right now, we know there are you know there's a dispute over in the east of the the the, uh, the uh, Ukraine. The, the claim is that Russia's you know occupying part of of the Ukraine. So if Russia if Ukraine was to come into NATO, does that make Article Five uh, operable immediately, and and then the, the, all of NATO needs to go to war with Russia. I mean, that's not you know clear, but that's the kind of uh, situation. And and Canadian officials don't 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 care. I mean, you know, unlike Norway and and some of the Eastern European countries, I mean, there's from the from a Canadian uh, uh, military arms companies. I mean, there's not much downside. I mean, we're not likely to hit get you know hit in the if there is some sort of conflict. Uh, the chance of Canadians being killed early on, or is not that high, so it, it's perceived as you know far away, and and uh, we can use Ukraine to to uh, try to weaken Russia, and well, it's just Ukrainians and and or other people in that region that are going to be the uh, the immediate victims. Um, so I think that's the sort of calculation of uh, of Canadian officials. It's crazy shit, um, the, Larry. The uh, how much of this is driven essentially, really, by one, domestic politics, so you get the saber rattle and look all huff and puff on both sides, not, not just the American and West side, but the same thing goes for Putin and satisfying the nationalist fervor in Russia. Uh, and two, uh, and maybe this is the most important thing, c continuing this rationale of uh, enormous arms purchases and NATO helps keep all these countries within at, at, at least the Western arms market and mostly the American arms market. But they can't be serious about actually fighting. They know what a shitstorm that leads to. I hope you're right. Um, the history of warfare, especially major warfare in the last 200 years or so, doesn't support that logic, though. <laughs> um, let, let me go back to something Eve said. I think one of the greatest travesties of U.S. foreign policy in the last 25, 30 years, and that's a lot of things, including the invasion of Iraq, was the violation of Jim Baker and Edward Shepard Nazi and ultimately Reagan and, and uh, Herbert Walker Bush and Gorbachev's promise that NATO would not go one step further east if Germany were allowed to reunify and remain in NATO. The fact that it wasn't written down is bull. That's diplomacy. Your word is supposed to mean something. And clearly, Bill Clinton thought people's word didn't mean anything uh, because I, I lay it at his feet majorly. Certainly, Herbert Walker started it, whether he did it to complicate Clinton's first term or not is uh, anybody's guess. But Clinton was majorly responsible for what happened. I was there when Shalakis Vili and the rest of them, uh, Powell's replacement, started the Partnership for Peace program and the plan for NATO membership, and we began all the arms sales and so forth and bringing them up to speed and all that. Um, that said, that, that said as a, as a sort of a backdrop, as Eve said, for this whole thing, the whole alliance today and the idea that we're going to fight Russia with it, or ultimately we're going to fight China with it, is just, I mean, it's utter balderdash. And yet, as, to answer your question, you see the political authorities in this country on both sides of the political aisle pushing this agenda. And you see Europeans, and I would say Canadians and others who are of that ilk, going along with it and buying it. And it's going to lead us all down a road that I think we're going to regret having gotten on in the first place shortly. Um, uh, I'll ask this of Larry again because I think you're kind of, this is more your turf. Um, am I mistaken? But the way I read it is that just as in the days of the Soviet Union, uh, 
The Russians are really primarily in a defensive posture. Uh, there's, you know, when they get all these threats, uh, and you, you get four combat battalions moved up, and you and the, and the so much uh, rhetoric threatening war and uh, potential military use and, and NATO expansionism and such. I mean, what does Putin do? What's Putin's choice other than to move thousands of troops? Uh, to, to not just in terms of the reality of the defense of it, but just to satisfy uh, his domestic political forces that he's standing up and not being intimidated by the West. Um, but you sure wouldn't get any of that from the way American media and or Canadian media. Maybe you can come in on this afterwards, Eve. Uh, this, you know, the MSNBCs and the CNNs and frankly, all of them, including Fox, it's all the same narrative. Russia's the aggressor. They keep using this word Russian aggression, Russian aggression. Um, and I, I don't see there's not many places other than a few small outlets like us who seem to push back against that. To, to that point, if I were in Putin's shoes and I'm not saying I condone him as a leader or even as a person. Um, if I were in his shoes, though, I'd be doing the same thing he's doing. Um, if you read Russian military doctrine since about 2012, and you particularly follow as the Finns and the Norwegians and the Swedes to an extent have done rather religiously their field maneuvers and so forth, you see clearly in the written doctrine and in the maneuvers that what they fear most is what they call, we say orange forces or red forces or whatever, you know, in our war planning and so forth, the public aspects of it. Well, they, they name this entity that is NATO, clearly. And they also demonstrate that they really fear, the one thing they really fear conventionally from us is our incredible advantage in precision guided munitions. After all, what did they see in the Iraq war? What did they see in Afghanistan in the beginning, at least? Um, PGMs. And so their counter for that is small yield nuclear weapons, what we used to call tactical nuclear weapons. When you read that in their public doctrine and you realize that they say publicly that they will respond to a NATO incursion into the CSTO with a nuclear strike at the head and the center of that incursion, you understand how serious they are. And you understand that, that what you said is true. They're very worried about that. We, we think, oh, that's nonsense. NATO would never attack the C CSTO countries. NATO would never do that. We're not an aggressive alliance. That is not the way the other side looks at it. It's that simple. And consult history and you'll see that it was that simple in lots of other contests in the past too. So Putin is operating, in my view, within his purview, uh, exclusively within his purview since we did what we did with Ukraine. And my president went to Tbilisi and said Georgia would be a member of NATO. Uh, what happened right after that? <laughs> um, I'd be doing the same thing Putin is doing, military and, uh, militarily and otherwise. And, and he's operating at a significant disadvantage when you understand that Russia is really right now just a capital with a gas station. You know, they really don't have an economy. Their population is receding. They have less people than Pakistan. They have longevity problems, life longevity problems. Bang, it's going down. They have a real problem. Putin has problems now. He has used his opposition to the great Satan. They don't call it that in Russian, but it might be an applicable term for them. He's used his opposition to us and to NATO in order to maintain political power to a certain extent, too. It's, it's falling apart for him right now, and I'm waiting to see what's going to happen. Are the oligarchs, oligarchs going to say we need a new oligarch and elevate someone and take him out? He's got an incredible apparatus around him, so that would be very difficult to do, but I wouldn't put it past the possible. Um, but he uses that. He uses opposition to us. When you look at Mother Russia and you look at the 11 time zones of Russia and you look at that huge country in history, you understand that they don't like being replaced by the United States and they don't like the idea that the Soviet Union fell to the United States. I'd be doing everything I could to undermine us in every way that I think he is to include what the GRU is doing on a daily basis in my own home state, Virginia. Virginia. 
Uh, Eva, do you find, is the Canadian media any better on this question of, uh, you know, who's the aggressor here and is there really such a threat? And two, I, I know you've been part of a campaign calling for Canada to get out of NATO. Uh, do you get any attention in the media? Well, w there's Canadian troops in uh, Latvia, there's Canadian troops in the Ukraine, there's small numbers of Canadian troops in Romania, a number, I think, in Poland in recent years, Canadian naval vessels in the Black Sea. But it's, of course, that Russia, that's the, uh, the aggressive country. That's how the Canadian media uh, presents it. And, and there is very little pushback. Even the NDP, the you know, Social Democratic uh, Left Party, uh, a few weeks ago, one of their uh, representatives was calling on uh, Canada to support Ukraine joining NATO. Um, so, so they've been uh, strong proponents of uh, aggressive posture uh, on Russia's uh, border. Uh, the anti-war movement in this country uh, has uh, called for Canada to NATO. There's a sort of um, there was a long, the, the long-standing position of the NDP for a couple of decades was Canada out of NATO, but that ended in the, uh, somewhat ironically, in the end of the 1980s, just as the, the uh, Cold War was ending. Um, but in recent months, there has been some campaigning against Canada and NATO. We had a breakthrough. We, the Toronto Star did a debate uh, on uh, should Canada leave NATO, the biggest newspaper in the country, and that was in part driven by by uh, the some of the activism that's going on, but no, it's it's a unfortunately it's a it's a marginal uh, uh, position that's held by uh, you know anti anti war activists. I wouldn't say it's a marginal position. I think there's actually a lot of people that are sympathetic to the idea, but it, it, it gets you know very little play in the dominant media or in a official uh, official Canadian uh, politics. Um, uh, despite you know the, if there was ever a justification for NATO. Uh, certainly, uh, you know, three decades after the uh, the end of the Cold War, it should it should uh, it should have uh, passed. Um, but uh, but there is not a lot of appetite uh, because so much of the, the the economic and political establishment are are committed to NATO, and so the debates uh, around the edges. Well, I can't imagine Canada taking that kind of position unless the United States decided to give up uh, on NATO. But Canada would never be so independent to do such a thing, not the least of which how important the American market is to the Canadians' arms manufacturers. And, and they could certainly lose that market. And as I think we said earlier, the, the, there's only one thing that matters for Canadian policy, and that's exports. There's nothing. I don't think there is Canadian foreign policy, despite all the human rights rhetoric, is about anything but exports. Uh, Larry, a last word on what you think should be American policy towards NATO. Paul, let me just pick up on one thing that Eve hinted at and you explicitly said. Um, suppose the Russians or the Chinese or both in tandem sent a carrier strike group or a cruiser strike group or an amphibious ready force, whatever, like we maintain all the time, off Corpus Christi, Texas. And we sallied forth from Corpus Christi and our media and our leaders said, they're a threat to us. They're a threat to us. We're going to take them on. Don't you think everybody would support the fact that we were doing that, whether it was right or wrong, is it inconsequential? What is Russia doing in the Black Sea? What are they doing in Ukraine? This is one way, and it's stupid. It's idiotic, and yet this is the way we do things. This is the way we do foreign and security policy today. We don't reason anything. We just go on instinct. We go on impulse. It's like the old story of the French leader, you know, who's suddenly interrupted by the people shouting in the plaza below. And he goes to the window and someone asks him, what are you doing? He says, I'm listening to the people so I can follow them. <laughs> now, that's kind of the way we do things in this country now. It's utterly ridiculous. And NATO is becoming a symptom of, if not a manifestation of that idiocy. All right. Thanks, both of you, for joining me. Thanks for having me. And thank you for joining us on the analysis.news. And don't forget the donate button, subscribe and, and share and so on. Also, send in some comments and questions uh, on foreign policy issues or other things, but particularly on that. And uh, we, we'll bring our guests back to uh, answer some of your questions. Uh, thanks for joining us. Mm -hmm.